Hi, I'm Patrick Dixon. I'm a parent, three kids, half a dozen grandkids, three little families. But two of those families have no prospect of ever owning their own home. So housing affordability is a problem for us and for most of the families that we know. So when I read in the newspapers that zoning local councils and NIMBYs were responsible for pumping up the house prices by $489,000, well, I sat up and I took notice. So I read the research discussion paper by the Reserve Bank of Australia on the effect of zoning on house prices. Well, it's full of jargon and supply and demand curves and stats. I'm an actor, I'm not an economist, and I'm not an urban planner. But with the help of the Henry Halloran Trust at the University of Sydney, we're going to get to the bottom of this. So our first port of call is to talk to one of the urban planning academics about zoning at the University of Sydney. I think my first question is, what, what is zoning? What zoning really is in, in modern day is a way to control land and to be able to categorise it in such a way so we can understand what can and cannot happen um, in that land. So tell me a bit, little bit more about the, the real origins of zoning. Like. A lot of the separation of uses or the zoning, being able to separate one use from another, is really a response from public health um, because um, if you have a dirty, unhealthy environment, people get sick. And often at that time, the dirty and unhealthy environment was due to the industry. I read in the discussion paper that the zoning effect or the constraint on housing supplies grown dramatically since 2001 in Sydney. So do you think that zoning and planning restrictions have been uh, more severe since 2001? No. No, it's, it's the opposite. I mean, you just have to walk outside and walk around Sydney to see that uh, the city is growing and there's a lot of development, a lot of residential development uh, around there. And that's because of the planning system. Next, we're going to talk to someone who can explain this uh, Reserve Bank of Australia argument for us. We're going to talk to Dr Cameron Murray. He's an economist, he's from Brisbane, and his life's work has been understanding the housing market. But I'm going to ask him to explain it to us in a language that you and I can understand. What is the zoning effect? So what the RBA calls the zoning effect is actually the difference between two prices that they measure. The first price is the average price per square metre of your average block of land in Sydney. And that's $1,137 per square metre for the average block. The second price is the additional price it costs you to get a block of land that's one square metre bigger than that. So that price is $411. So to buy that extra one square metre plot of land costs you $411 more. That difference is called the zoning effect. And the argument as to why that is a zoning effect is because in the absence of some sort of administrative constraint, people could buy those extra one square metres of multiple different landowners and accumulate themselves a block of land. But I don't see that being possible because I could buy 673 square metres, which is the average lot size in Sydney, by buying one square metre of 673 different people, but I still couldn't build my house. That's a geographic constraint. That's nothing to do with zoning, and it's always been the case. So what do you think of the RBA argument then? <laughs> well, they haven't really presented much of an argument about why this gap in prices is something to do with zoning. They've really just picked one of many plausible reasons off the shelf and attributed it all to zoning. For example, the reason could as easily be that when land is expensive, people like to economise on land, so they're less willing to pay for extra land that's not as valuable to them, having an extra square metre in the, at the end of your backyard, for example. That's a perfectly plausible explanation that they, they didn't consider. But it's also consistent with their other findings that their measured zoning effect has increased over time as prices have increased. Well, of course, as prices of land get higher, you're more sensitive to buying bigger plots of land rather than smaller plots. And so you, you're not willing to pay as much for that bigger plot of land anymore. And it's a perfectly consistent story, but it's not one they considered. For some reason, they decided it was zoning, and yet in their article, they don't really have any analysis of any zoning rules or, in, in fact, the supply rate of any particular dwellings in any city. 
I got some data of my own and went and replicated their analysis just to check that I wasn't confused about what they did. And so I got a bunch of land sales, put it in my database and ran the model and I too found that half of the land uh, was apparently, half of the land value was apparently due to a zoning effect. Unfortunately, the land data I used was from 1851 in Brisbane. They were land sales from the Queensland archives. Now this was many, many decades before zoning was invented or enacted in Australia. The population of Queensland was 17,000 people. Land was definitely not in short supply and yet that same pattern, that difference between the price of the extra piece of land and the average price of the parcel of land was apparent. So either you believe the Reserve Bank that this is a zoning effect, but you also have to believe that in 1851, decades prior to zoning in Queensland with a population of 17,000, that there was also an equally large zoning effect. I prefer to, to not believe that. So why do you think the RBA, of all people, who we should all put our faith and trust in, have made such claims? Yeah, I think they've fundamentally misinterpreted how zoning or how modern planning schemes actually work. They've interpreted them as being a constraint on the rate of supply of new dwellings that can be constructed. So how many you can build in a particular year in a particular city. But they're not a speed limit on development. They're a geographic constraint on what types of development can be built in what areas. Mm -hmm. And that's a common mistake for economists who haven't either worked in the property industry or studied it in detail. Uh, the high level economic theory just isn't compatible uh, with the way property markets work. Well, that guy Cameron was a young gun. Uh, the next gentleman we're going to talk to has been studying this area for a, quite a long time and age brings with it a certain wisdom. What do you think of the RBA zoning report? Well, there are, there's, there's two issues in a sense that they're related. One is looking back and the other is looking forward. Um, the RBA claims that a significant part of the house price inflation in the last 15 years is due to uh, 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 zoning, not allowing enough houses. Um, that really is quite unsubstantiated. Um, if we take the census data 2001 to 2016, uh, the rate of growth of housing was faster across Australia than the rate of growth of population. So we built enough houses. What's happened is that national phenomenon and that's not due to lack of housing. It's due to the fact that people can borrow at three and a half or four percent, where they used to have to pay six and a half or seven percent. What about going forward? The, the problem is fundamentally it's low interest rates. But what the what the bank argue is that actually if we could build more houses, that that would solve the problem. That that's naive. Um, and doesn't meet the statistical uh, facts. There are 1.9 million houses in Sydney. We build 25,000 a year. If we build 35,000, they're not going to radically change while interest rates are at the level they are. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I am saying that uh, it's not an answer to the problem we've got, which has essentially been driven by low interest rates. So what I'm hearing is that there's a there's an R, the zoning effect, but there's also an RBA effect. And it well, sounds to me that the RBA f effect is the dominant. This is almost entirely an interest rate RBA phenomenon, which the RBA doesn't seem willing to recognise. Well, this story is getting more complicated than I thought. Bloody economists. But I'm going to have one more crack at trying to make this discussion paper clearer. I'm going to talk to Stuart Lawler. Now, he's a development consultant. He's been in the industry for about 40 years. And he's going to focus on the issue of apartments. Um, the RBA study suggests that, well, they estimate that the zoning effect on apartments in Sydney is $399,000. So Stuart, what do you think of the RBA study? I mean, I've looked at their figures and they've made no allowance for car parking. They've made a very small allowance for 
professional fees, a margin of 15% for maybe a four year project for a developer. And that's not per annum, that's over the whole four year period. The other thing they've done is um, they've worked out a way, it seems, that they can actually you know, get the land for very cheap or just about free. Um, you know, I don't know what they're doing in there. These guys should be out in the marketplace. They make a fortune. You know, they've got land for free. They're going to develop it at low cost and sell it at high cost. Mr. Chair, what I'm, what I'm getting from reading this RBA paper is that you know, government is constraining sites. I mean, the government is limiting the opportunities for the developers to create more supply. Uh, that may be true in some cities in the world, but not in Australia. I mean, we've had record uh, approvals for dwellings. We've had rezonings of a lot of industrial land uh, for apartments. We've got record numbers of cranes at the moment. So we've got more than enough uh, approvals coming through. What's constraining development at the moment? It's not zoning, it's actually finance. Right. You're looking a bit confused, Patrick, and I, I, I can understand that, but developers, uh, need to put a lot of finance in. If you're going to build a hundred apartments, you know, it could cost you $50 million. And when the bank loans you $50 million to do a development, they want to make sure they get their money back. So what you have to do is get pre-sales. You have to sell apartments off the plan up to probably 70, 80% now to get banking approval for finance. And that's making it difficult. That's constraining supply because developers can't actually get the finance to do projects. So the RBA seemed to be putting some blame on zoning, which you're uh, disputing. Are, are there any, what, what advantages are there to zoning? No, oh, actually I think there's advantages to everybody, users and of, of the land, you want to have some certainty about it. And that's what developers want, certainty. They need to know what is going to be on the land. They, are they negotiating to buy land where you can put a three-storey walk-up units on it, six-storey apartment or a 20-storey apartment? We need to get everyone on the same page and zoning does that. That's one of the reasons you need it. So Patrick, is there anything else that I could help you with? Um, Stuart, I think it's been more than enough. Right, Thank okay. Well, Patrick, how did you go with your task of trying to explain the RBA discussion paper in simple terms? Well, <clears throat> well, it wasn't as simple as I thought. And from what I could understand, um, of what people were telling me, everybody seemed to have a problem with something, one factor or another, that the RBA seemed to take for granted. So uh, I've come away more confused than when I started. I mean, what do you think of the RBA paper? Patrick, I thought the RBA paper was a very theoretical take. I think a lot of things in the paper bears no resemblance to how housing market works. And I, I actually think I was very surprised how confident the authors were in their findings when lots of economists would disagree the things they were measuring certainly weren't zoning effects. It, it really surprised me too, Patrick, that lots of other research on the same topic have come up with much different conclusions and I was surprised the authors didn't think about how different their conclusions were from that previous research. Let me give you an example. The Productivity Commission, that are a big bunch of economists, looked at the issue in the previous housing boom. They were trying to work out what was driving the large price increases in Sydney and other cities. And their conclusion was planning uh, and land release had very little impact on the size of those large price increases we saw in the previous boom. What, why do you think they've done that? I mean, they're, they're the RBA. Yeah, they, they are, Patrick. I, I think we here we could probably use um, Graeme Richardson's sort of framework. Um, the two possible conclusions are, are possibly it was a stuff-up or maybe it was a conspiracy. Now, now, on the stuff-up side of the equation, I think you've got to realise that a lot of economists are pretty concerned about planning and things like zoning. Some of them almost have a religious belief in markets and are very concerned about planning and, and things like zoning and probably get a bit carried away in their analysis. 
I think the other problem, you know, on the stuff upside of the ledger is when you look at the people that were acknowledged in the discussion paper, most of them were either from the Reserve Bank or previously had worked at the Reserve Bank. They, they were just talking to themselves. I think they really needed to maybe get their work independently refereed, try and get some different voices to give them some maybe sharper feedback. Conspiracy, you mentioned that. What, what conspiracy theory? Well, well, a conspiracy theory around the RBA could run something like this. Um, certainly uh, sometime before their discussion paper came out, a number of journalists were starting to call the RBA out as being the main reason house prices have gone up so quickly in Australian cities uh, through their interest rate policy. And Christopher Joy, who's a well-known columnist in the Financial Review, actually had a headline in, in his column where it says something like, RBA, you've caused the housing bubble. Now, a conspiracy theory might be just after that stuff comes out, we've got a discussion paper that says the bubble's actually caused by zoning, not by the RBA. Well, okay, perhaps the RBA did get a bit carried away, but um, surely it's, it's reasonable for them to promote discussion on this, on this issue. It's certainly to have, good to have discussion around planning and zoning. We should keep reflecting on whether it's doing a good job. I think the thing that worries me most, Patrick, is if we really want to help people like uh, your kids being able to afford a house in Sydney and other cities, we've got to change the taxation system. It's just pushing prices up and almost every economist in Australia would agree with that conclusion. But if politicians think they, that there's some easy wins simply by changing the zoning system and that's going to make this huge difference to housing prices, they won't go and change things like taxation, which is what they really need to fix things. And I think the RBA discussion paper provides an opportunity for them not to really engage in real action. Well, that was a roller coaster. A lot of smart people, a lot of smart ideas. So I've uh, tried to put together what I've heard. Uh, Adrienne, who told us that zoning has been around for hundreds of years, that it's really there to keep us safe, to keep us healthy, and it certainly doesn't seem to have got in the way of development. You only need to look at the Sydney skyline to see that that's true. Then we spoke to Cameron, who told us that um, whatever the RBA had measured uh, was only one of dozen explanations and uh, maybe wasn't the zoning effect at all. Then we spoke to Peter, who with his raw data debunked the theory of the RBA and the zoning effect and suggested that maybe it was a RBA effect that really interest rates are the dominant uh, factor that's at play. And we spoke to Stuart, who highlighted that there are plenty of developments that have got through planning, they've got through zoning, they're all ready to go, but they're waiting on finance. So there's the finance effect. And last of all, we spoke to Professor Pete Phibbs, who really questioned the motivation of this report being released in the first place. So uh, I can't say I'm none the wiser, I'm certainly a lot wiser. I've learned a lot in the last 48 hours, but uh, I don't think any of us are any closer to affordable housing here in Sydney or anywhere else in Australia. So I'll have to go home to my kids and tell them to just keep saving and uh, hopefully their day will come.